you. It's wonderful to be here today, and I'll probably walk around a bit. The University of Michigan Mathi Botanical Gardens in Nichols Arboretum was officially started in 1906, but it's actually older, and it was a joint effort between the School of Pharmacy and the Botany Department. Um, an important part of our original mission, and 10 years ago, we were moved out of LSNA into the office of the provost and given the charge of be supportive of the historical fields you're associated with, but support interdisciplinary research. And we certainly like to keep and will foster the relationships we have with many faculty of your projects, your doctoral students, your undergraduates using the facilities. That's important for us to maintain. But <clears throat> we've been asked to think about new approaches in interdisciplinary research at the University of Michigan and how can the botanical gardens be critical in supporting it. One of the things you'll discover is I like to ask devil's advocate questions um, so no one knows where I'm actually coming from. So I'm just going to run through six real quick case studies of the last few years to get you to help be thinking about is the botanical gardens a partner, potentially, not just a site. The campus farm is one which we're critical to with the new faculty cluster hire of several years ago in the Sustainable Foods Initiative. Multiple schools, multiple departments, I see Jennifer Blesch and others already smiling, but the campus farm itself is a key part of making this happen and the garden actually staffs it. The outcome that the students may see in terms of food grown by students for students is, to, from my perspective, in large part, a socially valuable product, but the real question is engaging students with the faculty in interdisciplinary research, whether it's food systems, the economics of it, but to get them actually involved. Jeremy, who uh, is there in the middle, is the on our staff who actually coordinates the students. He does not run the farm, the students run it. That's part of the academic modeling with the faculty for it. In order to do this year round, we are in Michigan. We are now up to three hoop houses plus an expanding acreage that is being used in terms of food production or sustainable food agroecosystem research out of doors during the growing season so that faculty driven courses can be created, can be coordinated with us and for us to actually support it. Think about it. That's something that we should be able to help with you. Another trial that we have, and it's currently one we're reviewing, is a new medicinal garden. This was started with the request out of faculty in the School of Pharmacy and the, and the School of Medicine about how many of the students knew very little about the plants that were um, clinically important for the drugs derived from them, and could we actually have a garden where they could see them in the growing season? Obviously, that's not necessarily during all the class periods. And so working with the faculty, the one screen everything has to go through is the plant has to be the source of something that's clinically uh, demonstrated as efficacious in the peer-reviewed literature. If there isn't contemporary peer-reviewed literature to it, it doesn't get on the list. What's distinctive about the garden, excuse me, is it is a horticultural nightmare. Um, you'll notice that it is organized either by um, disease groupings or just cardiovascular. Tropicals, annuals, perennials are all mixed together. We're in year three of working through this, and one of the things that's come up with it, because this is in public, and this is one of our emerging engaging points is being the public face of science being done by faculty members here, is how to interpret this to the public, both online and on site, in ways that we're not advocating any particular treatment or therapy or offering medical advice. So working with the medical school and the pharmacy school faculty, the interpretation that we've come up with actually scales from very generalist language, including vocabulary and sentence structure on what we call a flagship plant, over to an immediately much more um, interesting and in convoluted vocabulary and concept structure. And then you'll notice down here, um, we have a list of some of the plants that are out in a QR code. What the QR code does you, um, and this is just one showing the passion flower that's growing there, the plants are just juxtaposed, is it takes you very quickly, has the link, to a, a run that we do periodically of the peer-reviewed literature as found through the National Institutes of Health Library. 
The point is, is if you want to find something out, think about it even for the public. You need to be able to have some training. What is it that you need to be able to do to study these plants? But just to come in as a general member of the public or an incoming undergraduate and go, I would like to treat something with X is to realize the naivety of the construct that you've created. I hope I'm making some sense with that in terms of where we're going. The faculty team that we worked with have all retired. So we're looking to reinitiate ourselves with, with re-recruiting a faculty group to critique this. We're now thinking of taking over part of the temperate house so that we can do it in the entire academic year. Some of you may be familiar with the Peony Garden, which for decades languished here at the Nichols Arboretum. It is the largest collection of pre-1950s herbaceous peonies in North America. With a colleague, Nastasha Vlasava, who's here in the audience, we've been working on a set of molecular markers. We're trying to understand breeding origin of them. Basically, it's what I like to call the figuring out the domestication of dogs, only we're doing it with peonies, including what are valuable traits that are genetically or, uh, linked, some that actually we think are, have arisen multiple times, the particular floral structures that just look very suspicious, they might just be very simple mutations, gives you a particular one. And this is one of our earlier uh, initial analyses, just looking at where the breeders were in terms of which continent. In the last two years, Nastasha's been finding tobacco rattlevirus on our peonies. It's very interesting to see that they're not necessarily, um, these are our particular accessions out here as to it's, ours are the green dots. It isn't just all the exact same uh, individual clones of it going and that how did this happen? How did they get here? And all of these plants have been here since the 1920s to the 1930s. The, the virus has come to us. In order to do these kinds of projects, we're working increasingly with more faculty and more institutions in trying to engage people with very different aspects of it. With the uh, College of Agriculture at University of Arkansas, that's the USDA's Emerging Biohazards Labs. They're one of our um, critiquers and collaborators with it. Another approach that we're doing, and notice this one will be at the botanical gardens, but the collection is actually down at the research museums uh, complex, is looking at long-term academic intellectual engagement and recruitment of students and faculty ultimately as well with a number of the tribal communities in the Great Lakes area. And so one of the things that it turns out the U of M has is one of the largest collections of corn uh, in North America, probably the second largest outside the Smithsonian. I believe there are over 3,000 of them. They're all known to communities, some of them to the individual collectors. And in the case of uh, Sid Martin right here, one of the tribal elders in the Deowins, she no actually knew the person who had grown the corn according to the records, and it hasn't been seen in her community for over 70 years. One of the questions was, would it be possible to assay if these could even be, if these were viable? Could they be germinated? Could they be grown out? They have great cultural meaning to some of the communities. So this is a study that we've begun to work on. <clears throat> There's an entire, this is the, the most recent meeting. These were all partners at the table from the United States Department of Agriculture. We had Dr. Christ, Christina Walters, who's the, the head corn genome conservator for the entire USDA. We decided to split off as a separate one over here of the intellectual property rights issues of ownership of the corn, as in does the university own it or merely steward it. Um, these are very serious issues. We are engaged with sovereign entities, that is tribal nations are sovereign entities within their own rights and from the perspective of some of the tribal communities, these are actually fellow citizens in terms of the whole construct of the legalities of how we're moving forward. We do have a draft MOU that came out, worked uh, in collaboration with the College of the Menominee Nation, but we're undergoing our internal reviews of it. Pulling these kinds of collaborations together um, can be surprisingly fast, but it's intricate and convoluted, and it's one of the things that the garden is developing some uh, experience. I won't say that we have expertise in it, but I hope what the projects are showing you we're not afraid of controversy. We'd like to engage more peer faculty with it to make things happen so you can engage students. 
One of the things coming out of this is our Great Lakes Gardens, where we'd like to be featuring many of the, when we are featuring many of the habitats at risk in this state, and with them the endangered and threatened species, and as well as typical ones. One of the things that came out of it with working with the Heritage Seeds Project and before is the ability to co-present contemporary tribal cultural information with it to the extent tribal elders and educators wish to do so and how to present that on site as well as digitally. At the gardens, we maintain and manage nearly 840 acres amongst our four sites. I say gardens as an institution. There's been an increasing effort to treat our habitat and ecological restoration infrastructure work, and I call it infrastructure in terms of it's, it's the plant communities that we have in stewardship with it. So one of the other initiatives we've taken with federal funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we're now several grants deep into it, is to make the data that we have about the lands, the landscapes, and our accessions on them available not only on the web, but on digital devices, so that as the faculty, you, the faculty, and students need to interact with it, you can find it in real time, and we can link with the other university resources. A previous one, these are our four properties, that's over 840 acres in total amongst them. And in our most recent iteration, we were able to hire a GAS specialist, Maricela Avilos, who's in the audience, and one of the things we are committed to is creating apps that you, the faculty, can use in real time for teaching, instruction, or testing with students. And we're looking for some more models. It doesn't have to be plant-based. It just has to be on our properties. And that includes quizzes where students can go to it. Not all the trees are labeled. Some are, some aren't. There are different age stages, different diameters, and the like. So if the ways we can help, we are also are trying to engage in very um, robust thinking about plants, a doctoral student in architecture. Omid is looking at architectural form in terms of biomimetic. That is, how do cell walls create? How, in this day and age of 3D printing and manufacturing, why do buildings like this have to be built conceptually the way they always have? Why can't we have every piece and element is related to how the entire structure, this is part of a proposal, uh, we are one of the sites where experimental architecture structures can be put in public with risk management and the, and the university's review. Uh, this is here presented hypothetically. Omidia also deals with coming up with all the mathematical modeling for stresses and how to actually manufacture this, and this is one of the conceptual prototypes to be installed. We have actually done these in, already. This, some of you may remember, Shadow Pavilion by a faculty member who's set, since left and gone to be dean of architecture in another school. If your research and your teaching needs a public venue, we have between the two sites a little over a half million visitors a year. We, are in, we have an interpretive department. We like to engage with people. Yesterday, or last Monday, we had a question from one of the faculty members in the School of Education about informal science education. Could the U of M partner with her as part of a three-site, five-year NSF-funded informal science education about how do pre-college students actually learn and how do they communicate science concepts amongst themselves? We already work with Wolverine Scholars, so we will be meeting Monday to put together the five-year budget, and the whole thing has to be in by October 31st. Um, I like a longer lead time than that, but these are the kinds of projects. If you're willing to think synthetically, creatively, and out of the loop, talk. You can get there. Um, go to our website. Just put in free transportation. You'll find the links for either taxis or buses that get paid for by the office of the provost. We now have a bike trail so that you can get out there. It just opened last week. And if you want to talk to any of us, here we are. Trina right here is the lead person to first ask. She'll route through, but here's the university services team, and I've already seen three projects here that I'd like to figure out how we can engage with you for getting it out in terms of how public see it and how students from other units see it. Thank you. Thank you, David. So we have time for a couple of questions before we move to the panel discussion. There are no questions. I see someone back there. 
Hi, thanks for your talk. I was wondering um, if you'd considered combining your campus farm initiative with some of the medicinal plant stuff, thinking about functional foods, just kind of reflecting on some of the talks we heard earlier today. The question was about combining the campus farm with other functional foods or school of pharmacy work. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is we'll match, help look for matchmaking the faculty because everything we do is faculty driven. We try to create the program content, identify the funding lines, and if it's truly critically important, we are in a $10 million endowment campaign. Every one of these projects has a half million to two million dollar endowment to drive behind it because we're trying to make the funding internally permanent. Good question, thank you. I'll be finding some of you. At present, the garden doesn't have a pool of matching funds, but what we do have is, is a variety of philanthropists who provide us seed money. Some of you may have seen some of the hires we do, the Campus Farm, Wolverine Scholars, and some of them also then put up the challenges of can we raise the two to four million dollars to make some of these positions permanent. So Bob, our director, and I will be routing him you through with him about how does it fit within where we are with working with the Office of Development for what are initiatives where there's some real enthusiasm behind it. Good question. <laughs> 